with the journey of broadcasting from past to future. And we will have Funke, Funke CEO from Holland, Mr. Stan Bayens. And journey of broadcasting from past to future is a really long, long and a long story. And he will try to summarize in the 20 minutes to us also. And his vision is bringing information uh, to people. Please welcome Funky CEO, Mr. Stan Bayens. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to be here today, uh, but the organization gave me a quite difficult task. They said, Stan, would you be so kind to give us an overview from the past to the future. Well, where the future is still very long. Uh, the, the actual situation is complicated and the past is gone. So the presentation is long, but uh, I promise that everybody gets a presentation to his private email so you can read more details. So in some cases, I just skip a few things or I just make a, a few uh, bullet points. The rest you can read at home, of course. Well, let's have a look. Uh, the title was the journey, the journey of Broadcasting from Past to Future. Well, as a matter of fact, this is the past. When TV started many years ago, uh, we had some old antenna equipment to see TV or radio, because today broadcast is radio and TV, and let's say that the radio was the first. So you needed an antenna for a radio and you needed an antenna for a TV, a TV set and a radio set, and of course a lot of people were involved to set up this kind of business. Well. We are now in a transition phase uh, with a lot of interest. I was uh, listening to the speakers this morning and I think that we got a few uh, points that are very important and you will uh, see today that these points will be somewhere in my presentation. And I'm very happy that together with the organization, uh, CEO who was helping Ratem, we could invite a lot of other speakers that will go more in detail. So my story is a general story and later on, later today, and even tomorrow, you will hear more details about it. <coughs> if you look to broadcast, there are some world trends. Some of the, tr <coughs> and of course, we have to realize what is happening. Digital media is entering a phase of accelerated disruption, and disruption can be very dangerous. There is a rapid development of global OTT players, the emergence of internet giants such as Google and Facebook, and potential players in media, and changing of habits of consumers. This morning it was already said, the consumer is playing a very important role. We have to listen to our customer. If you look to the trends, we see that there is a flexible use of spectrum. Um, there is the robustness plays an important role. Mobile, we wish to be connected always. Uh, when, you, when you arrive in Istanbul, you switch on your mobile, and you wanna see what's happening. UHD TV. Hybrid services, I think hybrid is a key word in, one, in the broadcast business nowadays. Multi-view, multi-screen, we wish to continue. We look on a, a big screen, we, we look on a small uh, screen. Uh, accessibility, and of course, personalization and interactivity. We do a lot of things personally, and we, we, want, we want to do the things by our own. Our children have an other habit than we. I, maybe I'm quite old and I see some people of the same age as me. We think in another way than our children and we have to take into account that they might go another way. Well, you do it with cooperation. This morning it was already mentioned as well, cooperation, doing things together. ASBU is here, ABU is here. Others are here to cooperate. To, we have to listen to each other. We have to see the needs all over the world because the needs in Europe can be other needs than in the rest of the world. And for the same reason, there is, we have several organizations that can work together. And today, RATAM is in, in the middle of those organizations. So there is a world cooperation. And today, in, in, on broadcast Istanbul, we try to listen to each other, we try to exchange knowledge, we try to educate each other, each other, and we try to work together because working together is one of the most important points whatever happens in life. It's a basic value. In this whole <coughs> environment, of course, the EBU plays an important role. <coughs> EBU is connected to uh, the worldwide sister organization and is organizing events uh, uh, and, and trying to help everybody who, wish, who needs help. For the same reason, I'm happy that also uh, an EBU representative, Mr. Walid Sami, is here today. The EBU, 
do realize that they do have 73 members in 56 countries and <coughs> that uh, the 506 TV channels are operated, but that the EBU is also taking care of radio. Another important organization is Broadcast Networks Europe. Broadcast Network Europe is, co is working on the spectrum issue and we all know uh, that the spectrum is an important point in, in relation to the relationship between broadcast and uh, the mobile industry. Uh, DVB is also here today. Uh, we are very happy that Mr. Peter Siebert, Head of Technology, will explain us more about DVB. And, well, let's then go to radio, because radio was the first one. Mr. Jörn Jensen, uh, uh, pr um, former chair of digital uh, uh, audio broadcast, DAB, is here today and will explain us more about it. But a few things, a few things, some key facts to support digital radio is that there is an analog radio is a bottleneck. FM is full. This morning I was talking to one of the Turkish colleagues and he was telling, well, we don't have space in FM anymore. There are new opportunities if you go to digital radio. Uh, there are hybrid capabilities, it is, more, it is affordable, it's not that uh, uh, cheap, and it's very cost uh, efficient for broadcasters. Of course, this is the reason uh, FM is full of congestion, and with digital radio, we will have more possibilities. If you look to, <coughs> thanks to the investigation of the EBU, you can see that if you look to the headlines every week, the, 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 uh, the radio reach is 85% to European citizens, and even weekly, younger people still listen to radio. I think that's important, and of course, at home you can see more about the slide. There is also, in the meantime, when, it's, when we talk about radio, there is a support for digital radio from the European community. And yesterday, this is the latest news of yesterday, when I was flying from uh, uh, Geneva to uh, uh, Istanbul, I noticed this latest news. The European Parliament voted to adopt the new European Electronic Communication Codes, and this is in favor of digital radio. If you look to radio, uh, we all know that something is happening in, uh, to uh, DAB+. Uh, TRT is doing some trials. This morning I was talking with Mr. Farhat, and he also explained me where the trials are in, in Turkey. But it's not only in Turkey. See that also other countries are now moving to digital radio step by step, there might be a long way to go, but there is a change, and this is a change towards the future. The challenge for radio <coughs> is how to compete in an IP-dominated world. Essential to optimize the broadcast experience is very important, and do realize also IP devices. Radio needs a multi-platform strategy, and for the same reason, DAB Plus states that online delivery hybrid, hybrid again, it's one of the very important points. The radio player and its apps, podcast and smart speakers are important. Also a smart speaker because content. This morning, one of the representatives, uh, Mr. I don't remember his name, from the Asian Broadcast Union, he said, <coughs> the content is important and, of course, smart speakers are important. Hybrid capabilities, still in, uh, hybrid, I told you, important, so broadcast and inter internet can play a role together. <clears throat> With radio, we, also have, we will also have in the future a greater choice. You can see the differences. The blue color is FM analog and the other color is DAB. And in the countries where DAB is already proceeding, you see that there is a big difference and there are big advantages to have more capacity. Even EBU members, if you see here the trend which is going on from what happened the last year, the last five years there is 60% growth of radio uh, in relation to the, the activities of digital radio in this very moment. DAB delivers, of course, benefits for society. The reliability in emergencies is important. Enhanced traffic, media plurality, spectrum efficiency, and lower cost and emission. And lower cost plays also a very important role for broadcasters in the room. But there will be also quite low cost for the audience. Well, of course, when costs are low for both, it's interesting, but still you need content. Let's not forget that, but content brings job, jobs. Tell you later about that. An overview about cost efficiency. You could study it at home, but see the differences that traditional broadcasting is still much cheaper than LTE. Of course, the younger people try to listen to the radio by their phone, but this costs more money and broadcast is very often free of charge. Let's realize that. Who's paying the bill? Cars. Something is happening there. 
the car industry is changing itself and is more going to infotainment. If you look to, into the future of the car industry, the car industry is predicting that there would be automotive cars, that cars that you do not have to steer yourself, that it could, be, could go automatically. This is future, of course, but then it, it, it also means that you want to do more things in cars. And when, you, when it comes to radio, in, in more or less all countries, people listen more to radio in cars than at home. It differs per country, and let's do realize that cultures all over the world are different, so there's not a general uh, rule, but in a lot of countries, the radio listeners are in cars. Some, some conclusions here. The future of radio is, a dig is digital and multi-platform. Uh, collaboration is a key to success. Hybrid capabilities and enhanced information is important, cost-effective and affordable for consumer. <clears throat> digital TV. There is a transition in digital TV. There, is an, there was an early start, of course, launched in the mid-90s for digital TV. Then, following to international standards, more things were happening from 1998. Satellite rapidly replaced analog, services were subscription-based, and updated set boxes to, uh, to uh, consumers was a very important point. Digital terrestrial servers were harder to transition because they were mainly free to, free to air, and due to a lack of business models, viewers were buying their own equipment, and this could lead to interoper interoperability problem. If you look, there is an impact on transition on the TV universe. There is a huge increase of number of services broadcasted. This also means that the carrier's cost per video has dropped dramatically, which is also a good point. There is a global, the global revenue of TV is developing. The revenue comparators, you can also see them. And in the meantime, something is happening, is happening in internet services. A lot of people are afraid. But why to be afraid? Let's be positive and let's see the challenges and let's see how you can cooperate and let's see how the things can, how there can be a kind of coexistence in the world because coexistence is important. Broadcasters response to the internet. Uh, of course, in, in the beginning, they were a bit reluctant. Broadcasters move their own content online now. Uh, route to accessing content which, which they can monetize is going to be important. It allows them to control the branding and prominence of their services, and building a trusted brand with advertising is also important. The development of TV, we can see that cable is, and satellite are more or less stagnating, and that the uh, digital terrestrial TV gives us more flexibility all, over, flexibility all over the world, and there are still a lot of countries that have to do a work on digital terrestrial TV. Even in Turkey, there is a consideration to go to digital terrestrial TV. Another point, people might have an opinion, but is the opinion true? This morning, fake news was mentioned. And yes, there can be fake news or wrong news. So my statement is, opinions are cheap, but facts are expensive. As a matter of fact, the EBU is doing on fact-finding. For example, there is a statement that we watch TV on Facebook, yes, for three seconds. And this is not watching TV. European and televisions, 89% of European, European citizens watch TV every week. And there is not a, such a, a big threat. There is, of course, growth of internet, but TV, radio is not declining that much as you see the growth from internet. Online viewers are still TV hungry. And an intermediate conclusion again, the adoption has dramatically changed of the technology. General digital TV has enabled increase in quality and diversity of services available to the viewers. And digital TV can be an issue for some viewers as they have to, of course, they have to purchase new equipment. Even this happened with radio in Norway last year. Costs should drop for broadcasters, but access to the transmission market may be difficult. So regulation is required. And we have to talk with regulator how to continue in the, in the future business. Broadcasters need to ensure they respond to this to the threats with a technical evolution, but also competitive services. Competitive services in favor of the audience again. The broadcast, commercial, broadcast is commercially attractive because in a lot of cases it generates employment. For a, a project in Tunisia, the total number of new jobs could be more than 2,000 jobs. Content. Content is king. It's an old statement, but nowadays everybody is repeating it. We have to see, we have to respect the king in all countries. We have to respect the president 
content is our king in broadcast. If you look to content, people are spending more and more time on media, but see the differences between internet, radio, and TV. Radio and TV are st still a big part. TV is the most trusted media, according to these facts of the EBU. I'm always proud of the facts of the EBU because these are the real things. It is not the news or on Facebook. No, facts are, found, facts are important. If you look to the EBU research and real facts, linear TV is not dead. The future of TV is on demand or live. And it's a bit of both. We, we are not looking the whole day uh, to one thing. Even Turkey is a satellite country, but there are also possibilities for other things in the whole uh, business, of course, in the broadcast business. Content is king, national, national and local content is source of job creation, source of job creation. Compared to other linear TV distribution, DTT has a particular role, and this is maybe, that's why I mentioned DTT today, it might be also a new uh, opportunity in Turkey. Another add-on is HBB TV. Later on, Mr. Peter Siebert will represent HBB TV and tell you more about it, but it's an add-on on, 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 on satellite and DTT, for example, also for the satellite in Turkey. HBB deployment worldwide, and I just have five minutes, so I have to continue. Turkey, satellite and DTT, let's realize a thing. Let's see the differences and the advantages of DTT in a country. You can see it at home when I send you the presentation. Some intermediate conclusions. Present and short-term future is hybrid. Internet is not killing. It, terrestrial, high-reach coverage across countries offers a national sovereignty. And con media content is already available in broadcast platforms. New immersive experiences uh, <coughs> are also getting important and will help. Some conditions for success. Interoperability is a very important point. We have to make sure that the right devices are on the market. Etsy standards are important. If you have good standards, you can make sure. DVB is also working on standards. You can ensure that people are working with the right products. Uh, there are some other uh, uh, equip, uh, radio. There is also, for example, a radio equipment directive to improve quality. In Germany, there is a Deutsche TV platform. But what about 5G? During IBC, I heard a lot of people talking from Turkey about 5G next year. Wait on, not next year, it will take a bit longer. 5G is not one technique, but it's a patchwork. There's an evolution of existing standard with a combination of many different techniques. Higher speeds and lower latency, yes. Better indoor coverage with less transmitters, but you need a good existing mobile and cable network. A, a huge network of small microcells needed uh, to achieve 5G requiring uh, speeds, latency, and capacity. Uh, <clears throat> of course, you have to consider more things about 5G, and I have to speed up. But what's the reality? Where, where is 3D TV? And where is DVB-H? So let's see what's happening. I'm convinced it's going to happen, but when and how? Anticipating on 5G broadcasting, Together with various stakeholders from a lot of European uh, countries, there is already a, a big group studying what will be the future of 5G. Convergence is very important. The convergence of the network infrastructure, seamless interoperability, and devices based, based on convergence is also an, a very important topic. No single distribution platform can efficiently deliver all services at all, to all users. Convergence solutions might help. All distribution networks continue to evolve, and broadcast broadband conversion is already happening, happening where the technology, and regulation, and business model allow, for example, HBB TV. A final conclusion. I try to stay within my time schedule. I would like to finalize with a few key media trends to be considered for the future. But the last word of my presentation was future. Personalization is getting very, very important. We wish to have our choices. We, it should be uh, presented in a kind of order which interests it, like target advertising. And the style of presentation will be different per device. Immersiveness, a deeper level of engagement, which implies a high quality. And quality comes first. A lot of people do realize that the quality is getting more and more important. Turkish Airlines is delivering quality. Uh, and there are price fighters, but this quality plays a role. Convenience, it should be easy, accessible, universal access, compatibility, portability, and an easy navigation on a, on a menu. Some of the menus are too complex. 
interaction. A good example is HBB TV. And low cost, because if it costs too much, we're not going to buy it. But you have to convince the consumer in a balance between quality and cost. Not too expensive, let's say, let's call it affordable, but make sure that it works for the end consumer, that it's easy for him. And in order to realize these, mid, these key media trends, the future of technology has to be smart. We are discussing now within DVB, for example, about things about the future. <clears throat> it should be smart. And what do I mean by smart? It, technology should be understandable, easy to learn, simple, for the consumer, of course. Usable, easy to use and not distracting. Useful, value of time and value of money. And finally, and this is also the final statement of my speech, it should be trustworthy, reliable, and a relationship builder. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have more questions, I'm available during the break, and your presentation will be sent up. Thank you so much. Mr. Stern, thank you, but I would like to ask you some questions yes. about, we talk about the technologies, technologies will develop every time, but you also have an importance about the content. The content cannot be changed that much. Which is the uh, popular content for the Holland or the, for uh, in general in all, 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 all over the world? It's a very good yeah. question. It's what a do you think about it, well, about the content? I think Content is getting step by step more local. The local importance of content is getting more important. Uh, I'm in a privileged situation that I travel all around the world. I see the culture, the differences in culture. And you have to adapt yourself to the local attitude, to the local culture. Turkey is a good one in that case. The Turkish content industry is dedicated itself to various countries and is making sure that they deliver content that is attracted for those countries. So I think content has to be adapted to a country. People in some countries, they, are just, they just wish to see one or a few things that are important for them. And this brings jobs in a country. Yeah. And international content, like you in Turkey, brings jobs in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So it brings jobs. Broadcast brings jobs. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you again. You're welcome, Alan. Thank you. Funke SEO'su Sayın Stan Bayense çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Tabii yayıncılığın yolculuğu geçmişten geleceğe derken çok uzun bir e, konu. Kendisinin de belirttiği gibi e, mail adreslerine detaylı olarak da gönderileceğini belirtmiş oldu. Sırada konuşmacımıza e, geçmek istiyoruz. Ebu Kıdemli Proje Müdürü Sayın Valit Sami bizlerle birlikte onu sahneye davet edeceğim ve yayıncılıkta dijital fırsatlardan bahsedeceğiz. Medya için 5G konulu başlıklı sunum için kendisini davet ediyorum. Now it's time for the digital opportunities in broadcasting 5G for media, Mr. Valit Sami. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to this uh, very uh, important event. Um, I, I will talk about uh, 5G for media. My name is Walid Sami. Uh, I work in the European Broadcasting Union in, in Geneva. Um, my presentation is based on uh, mainly on work of uh, one of my colleagues who is involved in, in 5G for media, who is Darko Ratkai, so I wanted to mention his name because uh, most of the content comes from, uh, from, from his contribution. Um, I will not stay uh, much on this because uh, Stan was kind enough to present uh, the EBU. However, I just uh, want to draw the attention to the counting of the EBU members because in the uh, previous slides, uh, slide there was a mention of 73 members, which is correct, but some of our members have different or several organizations under them. So uh, this new uh, version of the uh, uh, infographic shows the number of organizations uh, under the EBU, uh, which is 119. Anyhow, you can find this uh, in the presentation with some notes below it. So what I, what I will uh, talk about in my presentation uh, uh, is shown on the screen. I will talk about the distribution landscape uh, currently for public service uh, media, the 5G technologies for broadcasters, uh, an update on the CGPP standardization, because this is where 5G is, the recent EMBMS trials, and uh, mobile technologies in content production, not in distribution. The landscape for distribution 
of public service media and uh, broadcasting in general, in media in general. Um, this slide shows the evolution over the last seven years um, uh, of the shares between the distribution platforms. Um, these figures are gathered and checked uh, by our media intelligence service in uh, Geneva. So we can see on the top of, the, uh, of, of this figure that DTT is well implemented among the uh, other distribution platforms in Europe. And if we count uh, also the, uh, second, uh, the second set, second TV set in the homes, the figure for DTT is even, uh, is even higher. Um, now, we have to note that these figures, for example, for DTT, 29% of the main reception uh, in households, uh, this is an average figure. So uh, there is a large disparity between countries and it goes sometimes from few percent in some countries. I understand that in, in Turkey, for example, the, this figure is quite low, but it goes also to near 95% in some other countries like uh, South, South Europe. Um, we can see also that IPTV is growing uh, quite, quite fast. So in the last seven years, it doubled its share of distribution. But as you can see, it is trimming somehow the shares of uh, satellite and cable. Now this evolution is most likely going to continue with similar pace, uh, which means that uh, we cannot expect or we do not expect a uh, sudden uh, disruption of, uh, of this landscape at any near future. It will continue evolving, but at a, a low, low pace. Now, if we, what, what I show you is for the main reception on, uh, in households for the uh, main TV set. Now the situation becomes different when we look to the mobile reception on individual devices, especially uh, outdoors. So the devices with screens are now widely spread, individual uh, devices. And the media providers, they are facing this challenge to reach uh, every device anywhere and any time. Now, the, the broadcasters, including the public service broadcasters, uh, are already present on, uh, online, and they can be watched on these devices. It's, uh, also, TRT is, is, one, uh, is not an exception, so uh, you can watch TRT on your smartphone through, through an app and using uh, mostly the 4G uh, network and, uh, and devices. However, there are still considerable limitations of uh, such mobile viewing. Uh, for example, the non-availability in all countries of flat rate, high speed, unlimited mobile data subscriptions could be a, a limiting factor. Uh, also, the fact that you have to go through an app to reach one or another of your preferred TV channels is also a sort of break uh, of usage. And finally, the reliability of coverage uh, and the quality of this coverage of a mobile network can, can also limit the usage as well. So this situation has motivated the broadcasters who wish to make their content available on all mobile devices to investigate additional distribution means. And the most obvious candidate for this is certainly the uh, set of 3GPP family of standards. And on this slide, you can see the successive generations of mobile uh, technologies. And you can see that the, re the real breakthrough uh, for media happened uh, with the 4G, because it, this was the true uh, mobile broadband uh, system. So being aware of this, EBU and EBU members, organizations, have decided a few years ago to get involved in the 3GPP standardization process. And we, 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 we got an achievement already in uh, October 2017, as you can see uh, mentioned here, with the inclusion of requirements for broadcasting and public service broadcasting especially in what is called the LTE EMBMS. EMBMS means enhanced multimedia broadcast multicast service within the, uh, the release number 14 of the 3GPP standards. Now let's see 
Of course, the, the standardization continues with the 5G, but from the 4G, we had already this, uh, this improvement for broadcasting. So let's see what are the main features of interest for broadcasters in this famous LTE EMBMS release 14. You see on this, screen, on this slide, the main features which have been included in this EMBMS feature. So I uh, surrounded uh, two uh, sets of features uh, which are very important. The first set, uh, the, the small one, um, this uh, relates to the possible uh, availability of receive only uh, devices. This means that your uh, phone do not need a SIM card but can receive uh, the EMBMS service without having a subscription to any mobile device. This has been included as a possibility in the standard. And this would allow for free-to-air services, which is important for public service broadcasters, on the mobile devices. The second uh, important feature, which is gathered in the big uh, ellipse there, is the uh, standalone network. Uh, and the dedicated EMBMS carrier and the large inter-site distances which allow um, theoretically any network operator to, uh, to operate an EMBMS network without being linked to a, an existing mobile operator. And this is important as well uh, to have a variety of, um, of uh, uh, suppliers uh, for, for, of networks. So the uh, remaining features are uh, mainly improvements on quality and interoperability. Now, these features which have been added in the uh, EMBMS uh, are subject to trials, and we will see later uh, one example uh, or two examples of these trials. Now, as, we, as, we, as I said in the previous slides, slide, the 3GPV standardization process is continuing with the, with the 5G. So it is normal that we also get interested in what 5G can offer for broadcasters. So let's see what, what 5G can offer for broadcasters. And uh, you have certainly seen already this called triptych, 5G triptych, um, uh, which shows the uh, expected or the promises of 5G. So on, on the first, on the first uh, circle up, you see the expected extremely high bitrate of 5G. The next one to the right is the low latency promised by 5G. And the last one is the massive machine-to-machine -machine communication. So the main feature for broadcast, interesting for broadcasters, is the first one, of course, which is the uh, extreme high speed rate, which allows or opens the door for a distribution of enhanced video formats like UHD, high dynamic range, high frame rate, etc. And the other one, which is the, uh, the low latency, opens the door for possible applications in the content production, all right, for video links and, and, and so on. However, you should read, when you get the presentation, the disclaimer, which is on the uh, right-hand uh, side below, which says that these figures on the screen are targets. So they are in the research domain. They are not necessarily going to be uh, available in all 5G networks. And the second thing which is more important is that not all of them will be available in every network. You have to choose. So if you choose for the, the high speed, you should compromise on the latency or on the massive communication. If you, use the, if you look for the latency, you have to compromise on the uh, bitrate. You cannot have all of them all together. So where has the 3GPP standardization uh, got so far. Let's have a, a, a look to the, sorry. Yeah, where, where is the 3GPP standardization so far? The 3GPP standardization has two parallel strands going on now. The first one is the evolution of the existing LTE 4G uh, uh, standard. And the other one is the development of a new radio for 5G, new radio interface. So uh, the, the 4G LTE uh, track includes already the EMBMS one. And also it is going to be imp in, uh, improved. Well, in March 2019, we will have 
uh, a result of a uh, study that will possibly uh, result in some uh, more normative work to improve the EMBMS based on the 4G uh, radio uh, interface. In parallel, the first release of 5G is release 15, and it is uh, going to be published by the end of this year. However, uh, there is no uh, plan to include any broadcast mode in the new radio interface of 5G. So the release 16, which will be really specifying the new radio interface of 5G, will not have a broadcast mode like we had in the 4G. And the, the, the most disappointing thing is that there is no plan for it. So we don't know an, in, at which release the broadcast mode of 5G will be included in the new radio. So, as a conclusion for the uh, possible usage of 5G, we can, we can say that for the time being, the 5G as, uh, as new radio does not foresee for any broadcast mode. It's only one-to-one. -one. And we don't know when the broadcast mode will be available. And even if the standard is available, we need to have one to two years before the equipment become available. And once the equipment are available, you need a few years also to have the networks already deployed and the devices already available in the market. So the 5G new radio is, especially for broadcast, is several years away. We have to wait for it. I mean, we have to wait some long time. However, the LTE EMBMS based on the 4G is already there and we have already started to test it, as you can see in the next uh, slide. I surrounded here a very important conclusion is that 4G and 5G will not be a viable alternative for the conventional broadcast distribution networks, the DTT ones, or the satellites in the, in the foreseeable future. I think this is something important to keep in mind. So, Let's see what are the uh, current trials made on uh, EMBMS. You have here the copy of the two pages, first two pages of a report, which is uh, publicly available. You can download it from the link, which is mentioned, um, mentioned here uh, at the right. Um, uh, that summarizes the ongoing trials using the EMBMS uh, features. And I instead of explaining this by words, I will, uh, I will ask please to run a video that will uh, speak much, much better than me. Please, the video, please. Can you run the video, please? You tried it. Okay. Okay. In that case, I, I might I might have to. Okay. In, well, while while waiting for the video to to run, I can uh, tell you if if you can just show my my slide, please. Okay, so on this slide you see one of the trials that have been um, uh, carried out by RAI in Italy, in Aosta Valley, um, in uh, relation with the European uh, Championship that took place in August this year. Uh, the uh, pictures from the event were, uh, were uh, transported uh, to, the, uh, to the RAI uh, headquarters. And, and then they were uh, fed to five uh, single frequency networks uh, covering the Aosta Valley. And these uh, sites were equipped with uh, this uh, LTE EMBMS uh, transmission uh, capability. And they transmitted the live uh, events in this broadcast mode. Um, and the receivers uh, were uh, prototype receivers that were capable of receiving the signal, as I said, without a need for a SIM card, without need for an internet connection. So they were receiving the uh, live uh, transmissions indoors, 
uh, in car or walking, and the quality was uh, very satisfactory, very, very well, very robust. Um, uh, these uh, prototype receivers are uh, developed uh, with, the, with the collaboration with the university in, um, in, uh, in Braunschweig in, in Germany. Um, and the system uh, uh, proved to be uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite um, stable and uh, robust for this kind of reception. Uh, if the video worked, we would have seen the comments from the uh, director of the research center of Rai, who said that this is uh, quite promising for this type of reception. However, uh, this, uh, this uh, colleague from Rai uh, does not believe that this is going to replace the uh, existing uh, distribution platforms, which is the DTT. But this is a good opportunity for broadcasters to, uh, to explore. And you can find uh, the video that I mentioned uh, on the YouTube. Uh, it is publicly available. Now, uh, if you want to have more information about the uh, activity of uh, EBU uh, on 5G, we have a project group which is open to external partic participants, uh, which uh, deals with the uh, 5G deployments. Uh, and you can see the main tasks of this group. Uh, you can access uh, the page of the group to register and to get the documents from this group and to participate in the, meeting of the, in the meetings of the group either remotely or you come to Geneva to participate in it. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting and we, we, we have already more than 150 participants already registered to this group. Let me now go to the second possible application of uh, 5G or, uh, yeah, of 5G now. I'm talking about the future 5G. Uh, not for distribution, but for pr pr production of broadcasting. So what is the motivation of using 5G for production? Is that, uh, as we have seen, 5G has promising features, like the low latency, the high capacity. And we know that LTE is already, the 4G is already used now for uh, news gathering uh, from, uh, from events and for content uh, production. However, the current uh, work on content production is quite complex and we think that with the features of 5G it could offer uh, more flexibility and efficiency and extension to uh, other use cases which are not possible now with, with 4G. So let's see, let's see an example. You see here the uh, illustration of uh, two cases of uh, content production. Um, and uh, you see the number of equipments and infrastructure required to cover a live event. So you have here two live events, one with a, a portable camera, the other one is a, with a mobile camera. So you need mobile, uh, you need uh, portable and mobile links that require on-site video transmitters, possible multiple links to bring the content to a central point uh, where editing is made using like, like OBVAN or whatever, which was on-site and then transporting the material through satellite to the main studio. And what if this can be replaced by a very simple uh, uh, scheme like this? You have the, the, the generation or the, uh, the, tra the cameras themselves, which, uh, gives the, which give the content to a 5G network, and the 5G network will, will transport it with a low latency immediately to the, uh, to the studio. This is a uh, idealistic uh, situation and significant further work is still needed to make use of 5G in content production uh, uh, to make it technically feasible and commercially attractive. And there is another project group in EBU which is open to external participants as well that deals specifically with this one and you see the uh, details here and you are uh, more than welcome to join if you are interested in this aspect. With this, I finish my presentation. I'm happy to take any question you need. Thank you very much. Ebu Kudemli Proje Müdürü, Sayın Vali Sami'ye çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Böylece medya için 5G yayıncılıkta dijital fırsatlar konusunda bizleri bilgilendirmiş oldular.
Ee, öyle arasından önce şimdi son konuşmacımızı davet edeceğim. DVB Teknoloji Müdürü Sayın Peter Siebert bizlerle birlikte televizyondaki dijital dönüşüm dünyada DVB üzerine konuşacaklar. Digital Transformation in TV DVB Global Update. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. My, my first visit to Istanbul is about more than 40 years ago. Um, at that time, I was a young student, and I came by train, which took me two days. And I had not much money, but Istanbul was for me a big adventure, because I, I was very much interested in learning about people and cultures and different countries. So it was a marvelous place for me to be at that time. In the meantime, I have come to Istanbul many times. I saw Istanbul change and I saw Istanbul grow. But one thing has remained about Istanbul. Istanbul is at the crossroads of two worlds. So when you come from Europe, it feels like Asia. And when you come from Asia, it feels like Europe. So I'm very grateful to be here again. I thank the organizer for organizing this lovely and wonderful event. So far, the organization has been perfect, but could you switch off the rain outside, please? And with this introduction, I want to go to the subject of my presentation. And uh, I want to give you an, an update. And um, it's very difficult to do a global update because global is everything. So I, I was speaking here and there and trying to put some interesting pieces together. So first, maybe one word about my organization. So we are a business-to-business -business industry alliance of the world's leading digital media and technology companies. So I think it's fair to say that DVB brings the stakeholders of the broadcast industry together. And you see the logos of our members here on the list. And I think we have a marvelous membership which gives a good representation of all the different uh, organizations involved, like, involved in broadcast, like the broadcasters itself, network operators, manufacturers, and regulators. And it's our strength that we bring together different group to discuss and to agree on the future of digital television. And um, sometimes a movie is more than 1,000 words. And so I want to share with you a small movie. You are the first one to see it, by the way. DVB is a collection of companies and people that believe that if they work together, they can do great things. So companies can choose whichever DVB standard is best suited to their needs. And in all cases, DVB offers the best technology possible. No one knows for certain how the media delivery landscape will look in 10 or 20 years. But as DVB members, we will be ready for whatever happens. Right from the start, DVB recognized that the media industry needed commercially successful standards. So before any work starts on writing technical specifications, DVB seeks and agrees commercial requirements. That simple premise is one of the pillars that makes the DVB project successful. So it didn't make sense to have separate organizations specifying systems for satellite, terrestrial, cable, and IP delivery, because in the end, the services were going to end up on the same TV sets in front of the same viewers. So it was only logical to have the maximum possible commonalities between the systems, and it's only DVB that has done that. You can see technology evolution in media as being like a train that's always moving forward. If a media company wants to stay relevant in the modern world, it needs to be sitting up front with the engine driver. In DVB, you are always with the driver, examining the challenges and opportunities ahead. Right now, we see that broadband delivery and hybrid systems are quickly coming down the track, so DVB's work is very much headed in that direction. DVB has members worldwide. We currently have some 25 work groups actively studying new ideas, preparing the commercial requirements, and then the specifications. But there's much more. We have an annual conference, we have promotional workshops, and we have a lot of other ways to ensure that our members know what's happening in DVB. We're in a transition 
to a personalized media experience based on both broadcast and broadband delivery. There's a lot to do. Come and join us. Okay, I hope you all liked this movie. I personally like it. It's nice to see the colleagues. And um, this year is a very special year for DVB because 25 years ago, we started with the transition from analog television to digital television. We were not the only ones doing this. We have our sister organizations in America, in Japan, and in China. But uh, we were the most successful ones. And I think it's very interesting to look a little bit back at the history to get the global overview. So it all started with, with what I call phase one. MPEG had delivered its MPEG-2 specifications for audio and video coding. And DVB made the necessary standards around this MPEG specification. So basically, we did the transmission standards for satellite, cable, and terrestrial DVB-S, C, and T. And these standards have been extremely uh, important, successful, and relevant. And basically, they enabled to go from analog transmission to uh, digital SD delivery of television. So 10 years later, MPEG provided a new set of specification. It's, what, it's called uh, H264. And it came out in 2003. And MPEG did the marvelous thing that the new specification was twice as efficient as the previous one. So for, the, for, a, given, for a given video quality, you only needed half the data rate. And this enabled new application. So all of a sudden, you could do HD transmission, and you could deliver good quality over IPTV networks. And DVB, again, took up this specification, and we developed our second generation transmission standard, which added transmission efficiency to the already achieved video uh, coding efficiency. And in many countries now, high definition transmission is basically the norm and not the exception. And I think we also have been very successful in managing this phase two. And then MPEG did it again. In 2013, HEVC came out. Again, MPEG managed to reduce the data rate by a factor of two. And this enabled new application again. So we had UHD in all its flavors and the data rate could be low enough to deliver good quality video over OTT networks. And um, we were trying to, to generate even more efficient transmission standards. But, okay, maybe it's a harsh statement, but I would say we failed this time. So we started to look into satellite and we wanted to work on an S3 a new, more efficient satellite standard. But we had to learn that there are no new technologies out there. We could add a lot of operational improvements to the existing S2 specifications, but we were not able to make uh, S2 more spectrum efficient. And so we didn't call it S3, we called it S2X. And um, we made similar studies on, on terrestrial, and so basically we decided for the time being to stick to our second generation standards plus S2X. But we did a lot of things for the UHD transmissions. We specified how 4K resolution is to be used in a broadcast environment. We extended the color space so you get more lively colors on your television. We uh, did high frame rate, HDR, audio. We did delivery of UHD over IP networks, OTT and DASH. And we upgraded subtitles to be used with higher resolution. And um, now we are waiting for the next set of MPEG specifications. MPEG has promised a new video codec for 2020. It will be called Versatile Video Coding. VVC, 
Again, the promise is in the room to improve the efficiency by a factor of two, and it will be interesting to see what new application this new coding standard will trigger. Okay, first conclusion. For the single channel, we have no tools at hand for the time being, this may change, but for the time being, to improve spectral efficiency. We can still expect one more video codec. New technology, the better performance comes at a price. New technologies will require more powerful chipset, so we hope that the semiconductor industry can support us once more. And when it comes to the quality of experience for audio and video, we are basically at the limits of the human eye and at the human ear. So further improvements in the quality will not bring subjective advantages, improved experience for the end user. So I think we have reached now a certain limit with our broadcast standards and I think what we have done for video and audio coding will stay with us for a long time. Okay, now next snapshot, some general trends. So um, luckily I have also access to the EBU statistics and my colleagues at the EBU are doing wonderful things in collecting data. And uh, here is uh, the, the, the hours spent in Europe in front of a television and you see basically people uh, spend the same time over television as the years before. So it's a quite constant uh, consumption of uh, classical television in Europe. It's also interesting to see how the viewing time is being shared between different media. So you see here the outer, the, the blue ring. The blue ring is classical television and uh, the inner year is um, 2014, then comes 2015 and 2016. So you see over the year, you see a, um, a decrease of the viewing time but it's not a radical shift, it's more a gradual, a gradual shift. And what is getting more attention are services like YouTube or like pay video on demand, which means Netflix or similar services. And for me, it was interesting to see that DVDs, the, the green part on the top, are basically constant at 4%. So people still watch DVDs. And I want to share another statistic with you. It's uh, which screen, which device are people using when they, when they look at video content. And the interesting fact is the big winner is a TV set in your living room. I mean, it may be surprised because we always hear that everything goes mobile, but in the end, the television at home gives you the best quality and the best user experience. The big loser is a computer. Usage of computers for streaming content is going down. And in between you have uh, tablets and smartphones. And uh, it's here I show you a statistic from the UK. The black line is basically the percentage of, uh, uh, of consuming broadcast television, classical broadcast, terrestrial or satellite. And the yellow line is consumption by the broadband service in the UK, which is mostly UView provided by BBC. And you see one is going down, the other is going up, but it's not, it's not drastical changing. And I did the mathematical exercise to ex extrapolate the current trends. And the two curves will intersect in 2036. So there's still some time to go. So this I would call an evolutionary trend. And if you want to know what a revolutionary change is, you should look at this slide. And this slide shows you what happened to cinema in North America when television came up after Second World War. It was a radical decline. Cinema never recovered from this decline. But on the other side, cinema also survived. It survived on a lower level and it keeps the content level. And this tells me that all story media technologies will stay with us. We still tell stories to our children. We still read books. 
we go to the theater, we go to the cinema, we listen to the radio. So the percentages may change, but I'm convinced that no media delivery technology will really disappear. It will just be have a different weight in the overall mix. Okay, so second set of conclusions. Broadcast TV will stay with us, but user pattern and behavior will change. The transition to OTT is an evolutionary one and not a revolutionary one. And broadcasters have to adapt to this, but broadcasters are in a good position because you are a trusted brand. People believe you when you say something. You can be the leading on-demand provider because typically as a broadcaster you sit of a big, uh, big um, pressures of content. And finally, the big screen is the preferred solution. And for the time being, the big screen is the main way for the broadcaster to come into the living room. Okay, and now my third snapshot, a little bit of DTV, how digital television is used in Europe. So I start with my home country, Germany. And Germany is basically a satellite and a cable country. So satellite and cable are about equally, and we have about 10% of um, terrestrial. In 2017, last year, we switched to a new system with HEVC, a high dynamic, a high, HD resolution with 50 hertz, uh, portable reception supported, many services, quite low equipment cost. And it will be interesting to see how this switch will change the percentage of DTT in Germany. When you look at Spain, it's totally different. Spain is a digital terrestrial country with 60% primary reception and 83% of uh, secondary reception. So you can say Spain is really relying on, uh, on uh, terrestrial television, followed by IPTV with 20%. We have Sweden. Sweden has uh, a, a big cable distribution system. It also has a big terrestrial distribution. And the interesting thing in Sweden is that you have a lot of pay TV channels on the terrestrial platform. And you also have a very high percentage of secondary DTT receivers. So the primary DTT receivers are the one in your living room. The secondary are the ones you may have in the kitchen, in, the, in other rooms of your home. And finally, DTV in Turkey. Turkey is a satellite country, but of course, you know all this. I don't have to tell you this. Um, you are late in the transition to DTT, so you still have, you're using analog television with about 11%, and you have only one relevant dominant platform for delivery of content. And what does this mean for DTT in Turkey? First of all, most markets have typically two major delivery platforms for various reasons. It can be competition, it can be to give the end users more choice how to get the content. But typically, the case that there's only one so dominant platform is quite rare. You're late in the analog switch off process, but this gives you major advantages because you can choose from the latest technology we provide, like T2, HEVC, UHD services. So your future prey, future proof for the next decade, decades. And you have all business options open. You can go to a pay TV platform, you can go for portable indoor reception, you have free to air with regional focus, or you can also deliver very inter interesting interactive services, and I will speak more about this tomorrow. And one other important uh, uh, fact is that Turkey has still a quite successful consumer electronic industry. For, for whom this would be uh, beneficial. Okay, and this is my last slide, and I'm happy to have stayed within the time. I see my host is very happy about this, yeah. And in my last slide, Stan, I've stolen this from your presentation, yeah, you know this slide, of course, yeah. I want to uh, present our DVB mission statement, and our mission statement is strengthen broadcasting 
So we are still here to make the classical broadcast even better, but we also work on the transition to a seamless hybrid broadcast broadband services and delivery because broadcast will stay for us for many years and is the most successful platform right now. But the future directions, the future trends are going into hybrid and OTT delivery. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I said that despite the technology advances also, we still prefer the TV, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz Peter Zibert'e de. Thank you so much for the digital video broadcasting, digital transformation in TV, for the global update. Thank you so much. Now we will have a lunch break and we invite all our guests to lunch on the M floor, please. And we will wait you, what time? At two o'clock. We will continue at two o'clock. Have a good lunch. Şimdi bir yemek aramız var saat 2'de. Değerli misafirlerimiz sizleri tekrar e, öğleden sonra oturumlarımız için burada bekliyor olacağız. Afiyet olsun şimdiden. M katında tüm misafirlerimiz davetlidir. Tekrar afiyet olsun. Teşekkürler. <gülüyor>